Well, good afternoon and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and the Injury Foundation are so excited to have you here today with us to kick off another exciting semester of live stream webinar events. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science and we explore what's happening in the field, interesting careers related to marine science and more. Today, we will be talking to Dr. Chelsea of Florida Atlantic University and OctoNation and also about her field research on octopuses. But first, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our programming. Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The mission of CEFs is to engage K-12 students and teachers in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today that inspire the future stewards of our planet. And Jerry Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. The foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65 foot research vessel, the RV and Jari. In case you missed any of the information in today's preview slides, we'd like to remind you that you can submit questions for the scientists by typing them in the chat box. We'll also be providing a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to get yourself some really cool swag. So be sure to take part. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Chelsea Bennis. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself, about her work and why it's so important. Dr. Bennis, we're going to turn things over to you at this time. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be here to talk about octopus field work from behavior to bacteria. Now, I haven't always been near the ocean. I actually grew up in Ohio and I was first introduced to marine biology in a marine biology course in high school. From there, I decided to go into freshwater biology and received a bachelor's of science degree from the Ohio State University. I then gained exposure in marine science through marine science internships and research assistantships. I did teaching at Sea Camp at uh, Big Pine Key in the Florida Keys as a science instructor. I then traveled up to Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I was a research intern at the Marine Biological Laboratory doing cuttlefish research. I stuck on as a research assistant at MBL doing squid research. And from these experiences, I realized that I was very interested in animal behavior. From there, I continued animal behavior research for my master's work at Florida Atlantic University, looking at the sargassum community. This is a floating seaweed, a relative to the kelp, and why it's important habitat for fishes and other marine life but I couldn't stay away from the cephalopods, the squids, cuttlefish, and octopuses, and I pursued my PhD at Florida Atlantic University for octopus behavior. Now, through these experiences, from high school to all the way through my PhD, I realized I was very passionate about research, education, and scientific communication. So at FAU in the Department of Biological Sciences, I serve as a research scientist and also a scientific diver. This is where I do my research and my collaborations with other scientists, not just at FAU, but in Florida and also around the world. A really cool part about this job is also serving as a mentor and advisor to undergraduate and graduate students that are interested in research. I also hold a position as the Assistant Director of Community Engagement and Programming at FAU Stiles Nicholson Brain Institute. And this is where we create, uh, create curriculum uh, for STEM fields, specifically neuroscience for middle school and high school ages. Again, you'll see this pattern that I just can't stay away from cephalopods. I'm the science editor and writer for an education nonprofit, OctoNation. So for today, I'm gonna to focus on my research. It's not fun sitting in the seat, so I'm gonna take you on a virtual field trip to my study site where we're gonna go diving. This is at Phil Foster Park Blue Heron Bridge, located in Riviera Beach, Florida. And it's a beautiful day in Florida, nice clear water, nice clear warm water, and you get to see your first octopus. This octopus is out during the daytime foraging, and if we switch real quickly, we've actually got an octopus foraging during the night on rock and rubble substrate. Now, from these two 
octopuses in this video, you can see that there's more than one species that occurs at Blue Heron Bridge and just in general at South Florida. So at Blue Heron Bridge, we have these two species. On the left is Octopus vulgaris, or the common octopus, and on the right is Macrochypus de Philippi. That's a scientific name known as the Atlantic long-arm octopus. So we have these two species at Blue Heron Bridge coexisting in high numbers. And the big research question that I had was, well, how are these two species coexisting and not competing for resources? That, so that's a very large, broad question. So what I did is I broke that up into several smaller research questions to figure out what resources these two species were using to help them coexist. And so the first research question is looking at their spatial distribution. Where exactly do they live at Blue Heron Bridge? So at Blue Heron Bridge, Phil Foster Park, you can drive over the Blue Heron Bridge into the park, you gear up, and then you can walk directly into the water to start your scientific dives. Or if you just want to snorkel, it's a nice shallow area to do that. So on my research dives, I swim this entire area that's outlined in white. That's about a one mile swim. And I look for octopuses. Once I find an octopus, it's a shallow area. So I'm able to safely ascend to my dive float, as you can see pictured here on the left, where I have a Garmin GPS device. And so after I find that octopus in its den, I ascend to the dive float and I mark that location where the octopus was found. And so I did this for about three years marking locations of the common octopus and the Atlantic long arm octopus. Next research question was looking at the habitat. What's the substrate type that each species is using? And to do this, I use what's called a photo quadrat. So this quadrat is a PVC pipe square. It's a known area. And what I'm doing is I'm directly over an octopus's den. So if I took a picture, that would be what you're looking at over here. And that's an octopus right there. I'll take a picture of this, naming that the photo quadrat. So this is what I term the den habitat. Next, I take eight more photos in a big square around the octopus's den that I term the surrounding habitat. So I collect all this information from multiple common octopus and multiple Atlantic long arm octopus. I put this into a software program and that allows me to calculate the percentage of substrate of, of that's being used for the octopus's home. So how much sand they're using, how much rubble, how much rock. Next, I need to look at their activity time. So what times of the day are these two species coming out to forage and feed? And to do this, I have to know what the octopus is doing all 24 hours. I don't know about you, but I like sleep. So I don't wanna be out diving at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning. So what I did is I created a 24 hour octopus monitoring camera or the octopus monitoring gadget, AKA the OMG. And what this is, it's a GoPro camera with an external battery that allows the camera or GoPro to stay on record for 24 hours. For nighttime footage, we've got a red light. So we've got to have our octopus. I set this camera about a foot away and it records the octopus and what it's doing for 24 hours. And so here's a video. This is actually the first OMG deployed. So I was really nervous that the housing might leak or something. Here is my dive buddy and here I am carrying the camera and I set it down in front of the octopus. And it was really exciting to get this footage. It worked, there was no leaking, no water in the housing. We have an octopus out right before midnight foraging. And if you can see, you see its arms kind of cruising along the substrate. And that's called a speculative bottom searching behavior where the octopus is just exploring the substrate, trying to find the food. Next, you'll see the octopus after the bottom searching, if it finds a tasty treat, and right there, you'll see that it will pull that arm underneath its body where its mouth is located returns to its den shortly and then it leaves again after midnight. I'm not gonna make you guys watch 90 minutes of video. So I fast forward and we've got a grand entrance back to its home by the octopus. The next research question was looking at the diets, what the octopuses are eating. So they may be eating different types of food to help them partition their resources, allowing them to coexist. 
And so here is one method. I use three. I'll talk about this one first is collecting prey remains. And this is the most common method used for looking at octopus diets. As you can see here, I actually pulled these shells or prey remains away from the octopus's den. And I'm lining them up to take photographs of them so I can see them later. So octopuses will usually, after they're done eating, they'll discard the prey remains around their, their den opening to make it a smaller opening so predators can't follow them in. Octopus really wasn't a fan of me pulling those prey remains around and said, if you're going to check out my items, I'm going to check out yours. So you can kind of see the size of the octopus compared to my camera. These are relatively small to medium sized octopuses at Blue Heron Bridge. A lot of them are juveniles. And so that was one method used to collect diet information, collecting their prey remains. Another method is to actually follow the octopus. And this was the method most used for the Atlantic longarm. The Atlantic longarm here is a sand dwelling species and it doesn't leave prey remains around its den. So I actually had to follow it on foraging events. Sometimes these foraging events would be one, two, or even three hours long. So you can see here that the video stops and you can see that I actually was able to capture the octopus capturing a crab right there. And after this octopus catches a crab, it doesn't go back to its den, it actually eats on the go. And it continues to swim and forage and find the next prey item. So octopuses not only use their eyesight to find prey items, they also use their arms, their arm suckers. Their arm suckers can detect uh, touch or texture and the taste. So if there's a tasty tree, on that substrate. And finally, the third method used was remote video. So remember the OMG was used to collect um, the activity times. However, sometimes I would always, I would sometimes see the octopus going back to its den with a food item. So I was able to collect diet information from the OMG as well. And so from these multiple research questions, I was able to gain a better understanding of how these two species can coexist at Blue Heron Bridge. We see that the two species at Blue Heron Bridge, they're underwater neighbors. They're actually living right next to each other at Phil Foster Park in that Lake Worth Lagoon. Sometimes I would see them as close as a couple feet from each other and they're able to do this because Blue Heron Bridge provides a patchy environment. The common octopuses uses a rock, rubble, and structure to create its home, and the Atlantic longarm octopus uses sand. So since we have that patchy environment, they can live right next to each other. Also what helps them to coexist is they have different activity times. So the OMG uh, told us that the common octopus forages or feeds during the nighttime and the Atlantic long arm feeds during the daytime. Next, not only do they feed at different times of the day, but the common octopus uh, eats bivalves and the Atlantic long arm octopus eats crustaceans. So they're able to coexist by using different resources. And after answering these research questions, although this research door closed, it opened many, many opportunities and also new research questions. So the current research projects that I have going on and that I'm collaborating with, one of them is an octopus arm flexibility project. So while I was out in the field, I also collected foraging behaviors. So you saw that I was following the Atlantic longarm during a foraging event. I collected many, many hours of foraging behaviors of octopuses. And what we're doing now is we're using those foraging behaviors. So we have the foraging behavior right here along with that substrate. We're using these foraging behavior videos as part of this octopus arm flexibility project we're looking to see how octopuses arms are flexible, how flexible they are, and applying this to the field of soft robotics. So what we're doing is we're actually breaking down these complex behaviors that you can see the octopus doing here, 
So an example of that is walk. We're breaking up these complex behaviors into different arm actions. So we're going through videos and we're scoring all these arm actions that the octopus is doing. So if you have your behavior walk, if you look at one action, that could be reach highlighted in blue. Next, to get a better understanding of how flexible the octopus arm is, we then break up these arm actions into arm deformations, such as bending, elongating, shortening, and twisting. So an example of this right here is you see this reach. This reach is actually, there's a bend right here, but there's multiple bends, one right here, and they get really tiny. And this top part of this octopus arm is actually elongating. So it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. Since an octopus has eight arms, we view this video eight times. We have to focus on one arm each time we analyze or score the behavior. And so to do this, we have to name the octopus arms. So octopus arms were named in pairs. You have the left and right arm pair, arm one, left and right two, left and right three, and left and right four. Next research project that I'm focusing on at Blue Heron Bridge is looking at the octopus skin microbiome. Now octopuses play a very important role in many marine food webs. They serve as a predator, as you saw on the different uh, gastropods and um, crabs and bivalves, but they also serve as a very important prey item to the top predators, you know, apex predators, different uh, fish, marine mammals, marine birds, and, and so on. So it's very important that we keep these, these key players, team players in the marine food webs healthy from bacteria infection. And that leads me to the octopus skin microbiome. They may have unique bacteria on their skin that keep them healthy. So to look at this, you need to do a bacteria swab. So how exactly do you swab a bacteria? What I tried to do a couple years ago when I was figuring out the methods is swabbing an octopus underwater. Their skin has mucus on it, and this mucus should have bacteria in it. Now we were thinking that we'd be able to leave the octopus in the water, not have to take them out of the water, swab their skin as I'm doing here, and then move that tube quickly to a transport tube, still have enough mucus and bacteria on that swab. Unfortunately, this did not work. So that was back to the drawing barge to figure out how do we swab an octopus to get a good bacteria sample. And so during the, during the last year or during quarantine, I actually wasn't able to do scientific dives, but that was okay because it gave me time to kind of revisit how I will, um, how I will swab an octopus. And that's when I came up with the floating lab. And what this is, is a floating lab, like a boogie board, and what this is, it's pretty much an adapted dive flag. So I have to have a dive flag with me to make sure that I'm safe underwater. So I've got my dive flag, the floating lab, a cutout area to put an octopus holding bin. So the octopus stays in here and there's fresh seawater that the octopus stays in. So it gets oxygen. Next, I have containers that hold my sampling devices. And this is what it looks like in real life. We have, so sometimes you can create really cool science tools on a budget. We've got a $5 boogie board right here. And I cut out those sections, remember, cut out the section for the octopus basket. And then these are actually recycled takeout containers that I used with lids. So I'm able to hold my sediment um, tubes in here when I'm collecting sediment samples for bacteria. Here are my swabs over here to swab the octopus, the dye flag, and of course, water to sample water to look at the bacteria in the water. Remember, I'm doing water samples, sediment samples, and octopus samples because I want to see if the octopus has unique bacteria on its skin different from the environment. And so what this looks like in action, collecting the octopus in the octopus research basket right here. Remember, this is a shallow dive site, so I'm able to safely ascend with the octopus to my floating lab up top, as you can see it right there. Afterwards, you can see the octopus in the basket. When I'm ready to swab an octopus, I lift the basket out so it drains the water. I quickly do the swabbing to get the swab of, um, get the mucus and bacteria 
on the mantle of the octopus. I then put the octopus back into the water afterwards where it is released to its den. And that is a quick overview about my career path, the research that I've done and the research projects that I have, that I have going on currently. I'm excited to be here to answer all your questions. And you can also contact me uh, at these various ways. Right here, email. I do the outreach on Facebook and Instagram. And also you can find educational content if you're interested in neuroscience at the Brain Institute's iBrain community website and also octopus information at octonation.com. Dr. Bennis, thank you so much for sharing all about your work. We're gonna begin our Q&A session and portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. So if any of our attendees have any questions at all, please write them in the chat box on Zoom or on YouTube, and I'll be able to ask on your behalf. We have quite a bit of questions coming in so far, so I'm really excited to jump into it and ask you these questions. Um, our first one comes from Don, who says, Don is surprised that the Atlantic long arm octopus was out so long and wonders how optimal foraging theory comes into play with both of these species of octopuses. So th that's, a, that's a great question. And it does look like that the octopus, um, the Atlantic long arm octopus does forage during the daytime. The other octopus forages during the nighttime. And yes, yeah, sometimes they were out a long period of time. However, it wasn't all the time that they were out spending this time foraging. So usually when octopuses will come out of their dens, find their food and then quickly retreat you know, to avoid predators. A reason why that the, the Atlantic long-arm octopus can stay out during the daytime where a lot of visual predators are out is because it's able to camouflage so well while it finds optimal food sources like those crabs and has to find multiple of them because of its, it has a high metabolism. So by using this camouflage, I, had, I didn't point out, but you probably saw it floundering or mimicking the flounder. And so it's able to forage during the daytime because it can mimic this flatfish and avoid predators. Thank you. Uh, Oliveira asks, if any types of octopus live longer than others? Yeah, that's a great question. So in general, octopuses are relatively short lived. The two species that I study live about um, I'd say a max of a year to a year and a half. The longest lived octopus is the giant Pacific octopus that lives around, lives around five years. However, I think there is the deep sea octopuses can live a lot longer. I think the max is 20 years, but still in general octopuses short lived one to five years. There's also a second part there that's curious about why there's such a different lifespan between male and female octopuses. Yeah, there actually isn't. Um, they usually die, and that's just because of um, they both have relatively short lives. Just in general, both male and female die at around a year. So you'll usually hear that uh, female octopuses die after they after they lay their eggs care for their eggs and their eggs hatch. And that's because the mo mother octopus stays with the eggs and she doesn't forage or feed. She uses all her energy to take care of her eggs and make sure that they're healthy and make sure no predators get through them. She dies after, after that. That's relatively a year because she usually only produces that batch of eggs at the end of her lifespan. Same happens for the male octopus. He's just towards the end of his lifespan. And so he dies as well um, towards the end, of the end of the year. And so they've done research to focus more on that. It's called the optic gland. And so it will, it will cue. So octopuses will switch from just regular somatic growth to um, reproducing. And so as soon as that optic gland, those hormones change, that then starts them towards, I guess, their end of their life. 
Our next question is, is, is it common for octopuses to escape your do-it-yourself bin that you put together there? Uh, for the, the floating lab, escape the, escape the basket, I've had a few that have definitely tried, tried to climb out. And most of the time, they'll, they'll hang out in the basket, but there is a few when I'll pick them up, they'll start to climb up. So it's kind of like I'm almost rotating the basket. I think of it as if you've ever had like I don't, a hamster, a pet, a pet or a mouse, where you constantly have to move your hands when they're walking. It was, I was almost doing that when I was rotating the basket when the octopus was crawling. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for our next question is, what kind of bacteria did you find on octopus's skin? That's, that's a great question. And I still don't know. So this is an ongoing project. I've just I've finished sampling or swabbing the octopus in the field. I'm now in the lab doing the DNA extractions from my swab. And shortly, I'll be doing the DNA sequencing to figure out what bacteria are on there. So stay tuned to follow me on social media. And hopefully I'll be back next year to tell you guys all about it. Uh, Andrew wants to know if you are using 16S for microbiome yep. and if you have any cool data from this yet. I think so. Yes, using 16S uh, for the microbiome information that we'll be sequencing and uh, stay tuned on. We're still figuring that out. Yeah, he was also curious how it compares with other uh, mucus coated organisms, mucus coated. Yeah, great question. Um, hopefully, I will have answers for you soon. Uh, Lee is wondering, do you see the same octopuses over and over again? Do they have personalities like other animals? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I do. However, I, I haven't spent too much time looking into that since those were, weren't my research questions. But octopuses definitely do range from, I think of it as like a shy to a bold spectrum. There are octopuses that will shy away from, from you and dip down into their dens when approaching. Other octopuses being bold or curious will come out, check you out. If you have any gear, one time my dive buddy her gauges were dangling in the water and this octopus just came out of its den and jumped on her scuba gauges. So there's definitely, you know, that the um, spectrum of some octopuses being shy, some octopuses being bold. Our next question comes from Jamie, who's, who's wondering, do octopuses ink when you work with them? Um, they can. I, have, I haven't had too many octopuses ink in my work just because I was previously looking at natural foraging behavior. So I was trying to make sure I was at a distance where they were doing natural behaviors and I wasn't interfering or influencing them or spooking them in the environment. However, I have had a few um, ink on me, especially with this new microbiome project when I'm getting closer to them to capture them in the den. But I'd say it has to be less than five times. So I try really hard not to spook the octopus. Um, Alavera says she often sees octopus play with fishes and uh, wonders if there are any other animals octopus are friendly with. And for example, have you ever seen them interact with squid? Yeah, I've never seen I've never seen octopuses interact with squid. Um, I've seen usually I've seen fish following octopuses on foraging events. So it's very common for a number of fish to follow octopuses on foraging events and events. And the fish are trying to get you know what the octopus is getting. And so what the octopus will do is it will reach its arms down into a hole or maybe around a piece of algae and it will scare a crab out. Well, then that fish wants to go for that crab, kind of like a free meal. So sometimes you'll actually see maybe the octopus like get annoyed with the fish or will actually swat the fish away being like, hey, this is my food. Well, what are you doing? So I've seen a lot of fish following octopuses on foraging events. I've also seen octopuses interact with each other. They're usually solitary animals. However, at Blue Heron Bridge, like I mentioned, there's a lot of octopuses there. And so another way to communicate with each other is using their chemotactile cues or their suckers. And so I like to call it the octopus handshake since they can sense 
who each other is and kind of identify who you are by touching each other's suckers. So sometimes they'll reach their arms out, do the octopus handshake, go the other way if they're opposite species, or sometimes they will actually be octopus fights. <laughs> That's really fascinating, wow. Um, Alana's wondering, do, do the octopus, are there octopuses that make it onto the IUCN list or are they threatened, are they endangered? Where do they rank? Great question. Right now, I do not believe there are any octopuses um, on that are threatened or on that list, but there's still a lot of information about the population sizes that we do not know, but we're gaining that information. Sometimes it's through, you know, the large fisheries or fishery boats when we can get that information if there is bycatch on an octopus or octopus fisheries or relaying that information of are, you know, the population sustainable or not. Right now, it looks like octopuses are doing okay. I don't think there's any on the threatened, uh, threatened list. Bob asks, if during your dives at the bridge, you have observed what the Deloaches, and I apologize if I said that wrong, Deloaches refer to as nuclear hunting or a cooperative hunting behavior between species? Um, great question. I, I do not know. I don't think it's cooperative hunting when the fish are following the octopuses, but this is definitely an interesting question and a publication actually just came out about this cooperative hunting between octopuses and fish. And so definitely, I think more research needs to be done if it is the fish getting a free meal or if it's cooperative hunting, if they're helping each other out. Uh, Marilla asks you, have, have you thought about the research on the bacteria that live in symbiosis of the Hapalochelana, sorry, uh, um, Ayalata. And I'll send that in the chat as well because I'm just not as much of an expert. So I apologize for my pronunciation. I'm trying to, let's see, I'm trying to pull it up. That produce, so the blue ring octopus, it's about the ones that produce the TTX. So, um, so I'm reading this. I personally have not done any research uh, on this or the bacteria that live in the blue ring live in a symbiotic relationship with the blue ringed octopus. So fun fact is that all octopuses are venomous then in their saliva, they have enzymes that help break down food, but they also have toxins, one specifically the cephalotoxin that will paralyze the animal. So the animal cannot get away and the octopus has a tasty meal. On top of that, the blue ring octopus has bacteria that produces this neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin or TTX. And we know it's the bacteria, not the octopus, because this bacteria is also found in puffer fish and I think lizards are newts. And so that is the special bacteria that we find in the blue ring. I have not done any work with that though. Uh, our next question has to do with octopuses in aquariums. So Dawn said, uh, said that she has heard that they know their keepers through the taste of their suckers. And then if a person changes something in their body, for example, medication, they can tell. Is that true? I do not know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. And that's something that would be cool to ask, you know, those uh, caretakers in aquariums about this. I know that visually octopuses can recognize each other when they're, or recognize their caretaker or the researchers in the lab when they're passing by. I'm sure they can, you know, they obviously can taste with their, uh, with their suckers in the environment and determine if it's a substrate or a tasting meal. So for them to you know, taste your skin, yes. If they can actually sense if your medication's changed, I have no idea. <laughs> no worries. We're gonna start to wrap up with just two more questions. Our next one, uh, Mary says, I know you said there's lots of juveniles, but have you found any octopus eggs at Blue, at Blue Heron? 
Yes, I sure have. So I've found um, mothers of the common octopus. So I found common octopus moms with eggs at the Blue Heron Bridge. So it looks like it's maybe a nurse, uh, mating and nursery ground for this species. It's probably the same for the Atlantic longarm. Um, but what's cool and interesting and different between the two species, so a lot of octopuses will find a, a protected structured area where they, where they will attach their eggs to and then kind of protect their eggs. That's if the octopus lives in rock and rubble or structured areas. Well, the Atlantic longarm doesn't. It's a sand dwelling species. And like other sand dwelling species, they actually carry the eggs in their arms. So they carry their eggs with them. So a little trickier to find. I haven't seen any Atlantic longarms with eggs, but that's on my bucket list. All right. And for our last question is going to come from Sydney. Uh, who asks if you have any advice at all for aspiring marine scientists navigating their career or students in K-12 that may want to be marine scientists? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say um, one piece of advice that I think is really important is getting, getting that experience. And I really encourage if you can get experience, it could be at a zoo, aquarium, um, local fish store or actually an internship at a science center, or in my case, it was the Marine Biological Laboratory, go for it and get that experience because that experience means means a lot. It teaches you, you know, the information that you need to know about maybe the environment you want to learn about, but also it, it also teaches you if you like teaching or research or maybe you like something else. So gaining that experience also sets you apart from another person when you go to apply for schools and jobs. Everyone's taking classes. Let's see the extracurricular activities and internships you've done. So that's my advice. Well, thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, to learn from you. And we really appreciate your time. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to begin to wrap up today's presentation. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that. And thank you, Dr. Bennis, for sharing uh, your research with us today. Super enlightening and so interesting to learn about. If you'd like to take a look at the K-12 extension activities related to today's topic, they're going to be made available along with the recording from today's talk on the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. And please take a moment to fill out the survey, um, which you will find in our chat box. Um, bear with me here, I can't get my mouse to move. There we go. There we go. Okay, so we have one more exciting event for our fall series, Ocean Expert Exchange. We will be welcoming with us um, Dr. Danielle Engel on November 18th. We're going to be diving into some stories about manatee bones with you next. And for more information about scientists in every Florida school or in Jerry Foundation, you can visit our websites and follow us on social media here. We hope you've enjoyed today's program and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.